Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Market Bites. Hope you're all doing well. Please do remember to like, share, subscribe. If you're on the podcast, give us a rating as well. If you're on YouTube, feel free to ask us a, a question. Uh, I'm joined by Josh Gilbert uh, and Neza Malt. Josh, first of all, how are you? How's your week been? I saw you were in Queenstown, New Zealand at the weekend. Yeah, a little weekend trip to to Queenstown, which funnily enough is actually quicker to get to than Perth, which is actually in Australia itself. Um, But yeah, fantastic time. They're celebrating with a a few friends. Brilliant. If you haven't been, it's a beautiful part of the world. uh, So you definitely need to go. Unfortunately, I didn't get to go to your recommendation, Sam, but thank you very much for, for sending that through. No way. My my recommendation for everyone listening was was Ferg Burger. Uh, if anyone's been there as well, let us know. Uh, I can't remember the exact name of the burger, but if you have it, you don't need to eat for a week. It's that big. <laughs> but yeah, Queenstown, amazing place. Seriously, really, really good. Neja, how are you doing? You, you mentioned you were you were feeling a bit under the weather, but you're back now. You're good. You're feeling healthy. Yeah, I'm. I finally feel better. And when you mentioned New Zealand, it's actually on top of my bucket list and I would really like to go there but it's not as close to me no. <laughs> as it is to you Josh so I no. hope I will go one day <laughs> yeah I've, I've I've been twice uh, but never been to Australia which is ridiculous seeing as I've been over that side of the world but uh, yeah New yeah. Zealand amazing Australia on my bucket how list how are you to- Sam yeah, no, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> no I'm one check good. on Sam. No one checks yeah, on Sam. Yeah, no one checks on Sam. <laughs> no one ever checks on me. Um, no, I'm all good. All, all, all good. Um, the weather slowly starting to get better and it's getting lighter as well. So everyone's mood is on the up. Um, let's discuss a few things today. We'll start off with Josh and central banks. Then as you're going to talk about Lulu Lemon uh, and I'll talk about some market sell-offs. Uh, Josh, reason for you choosing central banks? Yeah, I've chosen central banks because I can't remember when we've had a week this big yeah. for central banks. Just feels like every central bank's gone. Yeah, I'll tell you what, this week is when we're all going to report. We'll, we'll just all we'll all get everyone excited. We'll get all investors muddled up, and we'll just shake markets up a little bit because we're all going to report in the same week. But no, it is a huge week. There's been loads sort of going on this week as well in terms of other macro data. We just had UK inflation data today. So really, really a massive week of macro. But as you say, dominated by central banks, uh, Bank of England, Bank of Japan, Reserve Bank of Australia, the Federal Reserve, and a whole host of other smaller central banks from across the world as well. The Swiss National Bank as well is is one that's sort of been um, a bit of a talk of markets as well. But yeah, I can't sort of go through today's episode without touching on central banks. No, I think we have to talk about that as an insane week, isn't it? Uh, And Neja, uh, your thoughts for your topic? Uh, yeah, today, uh, this week is actually also a big week for earnings reports. And today I decided to dive in in Lululemon earnings that they will release their earnings report on Thursday after the market. Uh, as you know, the company got famous a decade or so ago with their yoga pants. And mm-hmm. now they offer a wide range of athletic wear, including shirts, shorts and different lifestyle outfits. Uh, demand for this athletic wear actually exponentially grew in the last decade, and their stock, Lululemon stock, reached an all-time high of around $500 at the end of last year. Since then, it dropped by around 10%, and we will have to wait until Thursday after markets to see how they performed in 2023 and how they are planning to navigate the markets in 2024. I think it will be an exciting news, and I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I've certainly got my my eyes on on that. Um, still, some half decent earnings out this week has to be said. And uh, I've never, or I haven't got any Lululemon gear, but I've heard good <laughs> things. Seriously, I've heard it's really, really good quality. Uh, I'm going to talk about market sell offs. I mean, for anyone in the the crypto world, you'd notice maybe on Monday evening into Tuesday a little bit of a, a pullback in markets. So I think it'd be good to talk about how we're feeling, not just about crypto, but maybe there are some stocks that people own that have come under a little bit of pressure. How do we deal with that? How do we think clearly? How do we stick to the plans? That's going to be my focus. Uh, Josh, then, up first. Central banks galore this week. It's a joke, isn't it? We've had the RBA, the Bank of Japan, and later this week, we've got the Bank of England, and, of course, the Fed later today. 
uh, on Wednesday for those people that are listening today. Uh, a huge week of macro. Uh, what's happened so far? Yeah, well, the RBA kicked us off first out of the gate, as we sort of should be, given that we are, uh, you know, well ahead of the world in terms of timings here. Um, and unsurprisingly, sort of kept rates on hold, as is likely to be the case for pretty much most of those other central banks, other than the one we're going to mention there today. Um, but its case to sort of hike rates really is sort of continuing to diminish. So really, the Reserve Bank of Australia is slightly behind maybe where the Federal Reserve are. Um, actually, last hike came at the back end of last year in November. So still really kept their hiking bias uh, for a fair period, whereas the Fed had pretty much lost theirs a, a long time ago. But this sort of decision, really, the, the focus then shifted to when we're going to get the, the, the sort of the first cut. That's really what we were looking at. And I think yesterday's decision pushed back expectations for the timing of that cut. Markets are now looking towards August for the first cut but a 90% chance that they actually cut in August. So, you know, really that's that's actually not too bad given that the last hike was in November. Initially, markets were looking for June. Um, the June meeting is still live, about a 40 to 50% chance, but I think really it's, it's going to be August for that first cut. Um, the statement and Michelle Bullock, the governor, her presser after, afterwards was, was somewhat arguably less hawkish. It was up for debate, this. Um, really, there wasn't a huge change of language, but when you haven't got much to go on, you sort of take those little bits. And, and essentially, they've removed the line of further hikes can't be ruled out to we can't rule anything in or out. So a very, very subtle change in language. But some, as I say, have said that that is the first sign in the easing of language and essentially taking away that hiking bias. But they are still continuing to adopt the strategy that they are unwilling to sort of really declare the job is done and fighting inflation. Uh, Michelle Bullock said in a statement in the press or after uh, that the war is not won and inflation is still a bumpy ride. And we know that, I mean, we look at the US and we'll touch on the US in, in sort of just a moment, but again, it is no, no central bank is going to sort of want to sort of wave that white flag too early. Um, and that's why we're sort of seeing them uh, again, sort of really not willing to take their foot off the gas just for the, the time being. Um, but the big news was really the Bank of Japan. They hiked rates for the first time since 2007, which was a huge, huge policy change, signaling that Japan is sort of left behind economic stagnation and deflation. Um, and that is because inflation has gradually began to return to the country. So, you know, for those that aren't, are unaware, you know, the Japan have sort of been fighting a completely different battle to pretty much the rest of the world. The rest of the world has been lifting interest rates aggressively over the last couple of years to bring down inflation, whereas Japan has had uh, essentially very easy monetary policy, ne negative interest rates um, because they haven't had, you know, the worry of inflation so that they've mm -hmm. had the complete opposite. Um, and one of the big reasons for this was Japanese companies agreed to a large wage hike last week, which essentially boosted expectations that bigger paychecks will make households more willing to spend money, which ultimately could drive inflation higher. So again, it was a, a bit of a, um, a sort of a broad move from the Bank of Japan, many saying it was a brave move as well, sort of acting very quickly on the back of those sort of wage hikes. So it'd be really interesting to see what's next and and essentially they, they didn't just raise rates they ended yield curve control etf and jre purchases as well and they also laid out plans to scrap corporate debt and commercial paper buying as well and as i say i think the focus now turns to when we are going to see another hike and i think that's what markets are looking at their statement was quite clear they won't be in a rush to raise rates again and markets do tend to agree for the time being they're not seeing another hike until september or October. And that itself weighed on the yen. So a lot of people were expecting we get this hike, and we're going to see, you know, markets, you know, sort of be super chaotic, but we didn't really get that we saw an initial spike from the yen, but it did ultimately weigh on the yen in the end, because yes, it's a sort of maybe a token hike, but we're probably not going to see another hike until the end of the year. But a weaker yen did help give the Nikkei a bit of a lift and it moved back above the 40,000 level. So a big week already, uh, and we're not done yet. 
So central banks all around the world really have a tough time navigating interest rates and inflation. But the one everyone really wants to know is the Fed. Uh, so what do you think investors should be watching at their meeting on Wednesday today? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, uh, everyone's watching it. But poor old Jerome Powell, he's, uh, he's not getting his money's worth, is he, for being the most watched man? Uh, in the world. My, my comment there is because he doesn't get paid very well. He gets paid less than a lot of central bankers uh, around the world. But um, yeah, look, last week's hotter than inflation print, I think, tells us, you know, that we've had now two upside surprises. So ultimately, not an anomaly. We're sort of starting to see maybe a bit of a trend there that inflation is sort of stalling a little bit. And as I say, market pricing has shifted a fair bit in the last week or so. Market expectations are still looking for a cut in June, but that's now around about a 50% chance. And that is down significantly from where we were a few weeks ago. If we go back to maybe the start of the year, we're pretty firmly set on uh, you know, a cut in, in May. So that has been pushed back significantly. And that pushback, I think, is also going to slow down the rotation that we may see into you know, those cheaper equity sectors um that we expect to happen once rate cuts are coming so think of you know your real estate healthcare as those rate sensitive sectors we do believe that rotation is going to happen but again that may be slightly slower now uh, if we do continue to see that expectation for rate cuts moved to a little bit later in the year but i think the real worry here for investors will be that given that we've had a couple of higher uh, inflation prints than we've been expected that the Fed may then take on a higher for longer approach as well. I think that that sort of downtrend in inflation, as I said a moment ago, does seem to be stalling slightly. And I think the Fed would like to see it continue moving lower before they begin sort of easing rates as well. Um, given that, pretty simple. Rates are going to stay on hold this week. Therefore, that focus then shifts to Jay Powell and his comments. You know, And I wouldn't be surprised to see some pushback um, because you know, ultimately, we, we have had some stronger than inflation prints. We've got stocks at record highs. You know, that makes a lot of sense for him to push back against markets for the time being, which ultimately could slow markets down slightly, which I don't think would be a bad thing, given the run that we've seen this year. We, we spoke about record highs in the last couple of weeks and, and the numbers that the S&P 500 is annualizing so far. Uh, so it wouldn't be a bad thing to get a bit of a breather. But it would take something, I think, really dramatic, really out of left field to unsettle this market and to see a real sharp or deep sell off. And I think if we did get any weakness, you know, I would really expect investors to be very quick in taking the opportunity to step up and buy uh, the sell off because, you know, we do know rate cuts are coming and we do, do still have the view that, you know, earnings are going to be growing in double digits in the second half of this year as well. So a lot of positivity and, and, a, and a lot of reason there for investors to sort of buy up any weakness that we do see. Um, one thing to also keep an eye on as well is we are going to get an update on the dot plot, uh, which will be very closely watched. And I think that's likely to see the board move from three cuts down to two for the year. But I think the markets are already sort of bracing for that pushback already as well. So I don't think that will have a huge impact. As I said, I think it's going to take something really out of left field to shake the market. We'll also get some updates as well on things like unemployment, inflation, and GDP. So yeah, a massive week from the Fed as well. Uh, Jay Powell's got a you know big uh, a big job to do uh, to sort of temper down this market, to temper down those expectations. But you know, we're still of the view that we are going to get that cut in the middle of this year. Yeah, the S&P 500 closing at a record high yesterday. It's 18 for the year, uh, away off those 70, uh, 170 that we saw in, in 2021, but uh, on the right track, nonetheless. Um, a market that isn't quite on all-time highs is Lulu, uh, Neja, as you mentioned. So that's dropped a little bit recently. What's the reason for that? And then heading into Thursday, what are the market expectations for their report? Uh, yeah, in 2023, actually, Lululemon sto uh, stock rose by roughly 60%, which is better than all major three US indices. Uh, even in their last earnings report, they su surprised um, the market, and uh, the st but the stock dropped in the beginning of the year because investors were worried about shoppers not spending that much and not so great holiday forecast in December. So now it is trading around 10% from its all-time high that was set at the end of the last week, uh, in the end of the last year, 
all-time high was about $511, something like that. Mm -hmm. And if we talk about uh, earnings expectations, uh, that's for earnings that will be released on Thursday, the market ex is expecting Lululemon to report earnings per share of $5, which would be almost 14% higher compared to the same time last year. Regarding revenue, the market is expecting the number to be just under $14 billion. So we will have to wait until Thursday to see if they actually manage to beat those expectations. Yeah, well, Nike are obviously reporting after, uh, tomorrow after the market as well. I mean, what metrics <laughs> specific to the industry are the most important in your opinion there? Uh, as you mentioned, Nike, uh, Nike is one of their main, main competitors. Sports apparel industry is really competitive industry. And Nike plays a major role here as it is the biggest company in this sector if we compare these main players based on market share or sales. Yet nowadays, it's as common to see people out there wearing Lululemon or outfits as Nike outfits. And that wasn't the case just a few years ago. And Lululemon really managed to make, make a name for themselves. And now it's, it is one of the biggest players in the industry. They are also sponsoring some athletes. And at, yeah, in last year, they announced a new deal with Peloton. It's a five-year partnership deal. And that's also something that I'm looking forward to hear more about. Um, in, some metrics that I like to look at when analyzing companies like Nike or Lululemon uh, are sales revenue growth, which gives us more perspective on what is the market demand for their products. I also like to, uh, to take a look at inventory turnover, margins, and how strong is the brand compared to other peers in the industry. I think that those metrics are really important to take a look at when analyzing sports apparel companies. Yeah, a really interesting time for, for these businesses. I think Nike laid off about 2% of its staff, I believe, in the last sort of month or so as well. So going into sort of cost-cutting mode you know maybe due to sort of higher inventories things like that we will get updates on that this week interesting you mentioned as well about the sponsoring some athletes i was looking at one of their uh their golf pros they'd sponsored the other day and they're known for not having logos on the front of their outfits yeah. lemon right and they've actually now had to revoke that because they've obviously paid a fortune to sponsor some of these golf athletes and they've had to put sort of logos all over the front of their jerseys which i thought was quite interesting um and you also mentioned their Peloton, there's a, um, there's a Peloton store in Sydney that I walk past every day and I do look at them and I do think they are very cool. They were the craze, right, in lockdown. Pandemic. Everyone wanted one. They yeah. are ridiculously expensive though. Uh, so tell us, what does that Lululemon and Peloton partnership look like? So as always, we don't have Peloton shop here in Slovenia, so <laughs> I'm not passing by it every day. Uh, but yeah, as you know, Lululemon is selling sports apparel and a Peloton main business is selling those expensive bikes and class subscriptions. Both companies tried to succeed in business areas of one another, but now they decide to give up and is instead team up together in, in this five-year partnership deal. For that deal, Lululemon actually had to give up their uh, home fitness device Mirror, uh, which they acquired in 2020 for around $500 million. Uh, it was basically a mirror that displayed uh, workout videos that you could follow up from your home. With this deal, Lululemon came, uh, became one, the main maker of Peloton branded workout clothes and Peloton had to cut back, uh, cut back on making their own clothes. On the other hand, Lululemon uh, had to stop selling mirror fitness devices, uh, and it's not selling these Peloton-like fitness classes anymore. Uh, instead, Peloton fitness classes are now available in Lululemon uh, app. And this deal, I think it's a very, very interesting move for both uh, for both of the companies, and I'm looking forward to see how they will comment on this deal in the, their earnings report and what are their plans ahead. It's quite an interesting deal. It just sounds like you stop selling what we sell and we'll stop selling exactly. what you sell as well. Yeah. Uh, but look, I mean, two great brands, you know, it makes sense for 
for sort of both to be working together. And again, if you've got two great companies teaming up like that, I'm sure that it always work well. And as you mentioned there as well about the stock sort of coming off slightly from its all time high on Monday evening, we saw crypto come under some big, big pressure. And I think if we were to sit here and name a number of stocks, you know, over time, they've all experienced decent sized yeah. moves lower over their history. You know, we can talk about Apple, we can talk about Microsoft, we can talk about all of these companies. We can also talk about it in a crypto sense as well. We've seen many, many retreats from crypto over its history. And it is part of the course if you are a crypto investor. But my question to you is, Sam, how do investors and traders remain calm in these situations when their investments do move in the opposite direction to what they want, because they can make you feel a bit uneasy, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you make a good point. Um, I'm just getting up a poem, which will make sense in a, in a while. Um, you make a good point, obviously, about, about crypto. That is par for the course. And, and, and I think being able to deal with these sell-offs comes from actually understanding that market volatility. I saw a really good tweet yesterday from one of our PI, Steve and uh, Budgen, who was talking about just the, the Bitcoin volatility and the amount of pullbacks that we've had, whether they be 20% uh, or, or higher. So you had eight 20% pullbacks, um, you know, hang on, let me just get these, these years up. Uh, in 2011 to 2013, you had 19 20% full pullbacks. In 2013, you had five. 2015 to 17, you had 17. 2018, 2019, you had three. Uh, 2020 to 2021, you had eight. And 2022 to 2024, you had four. The point being, if you were to see a 20% pullback now and get out, you kind of, or, or get out your, your investment, you're kind of, you're not well informed enough, I guess, on the fact that that volatility is, is as Josh said, par for the course. When I first got into the world of trading uh, and investing, uh, I was doing a, a course and the first thing, or one of the first things my, my mentor uh, read out was a poem by Rudyard Kipling called If. And I, I recommend people to go listen to that. It's something like, if you can remain calm under pressure, it's very, very motivational. Uh, and it reminds me uh, of, you know, being in stocks or trades or investments that have come under pressure. And I, you know, hands up at the very beginning of my career, I panic and get out. And then look back if it was a trade a couple of hours later, if it was an investment a few months later, and it's done exactly what I thought it would do. So yes, experience helps a lot, but understanding that market volatility can be key. Obviously, having a long-term perspective in, in the investing world can be hugely beneficial. Uh, so having that, that, that perspective to you know, think longer in the horizon is something I would recommend. Focus on the overall trajectory of the investment rather than those short-term fluctuations you just need to look at the charts to see that these moves do happen that you can have periods of some of the biggest stocks in the world having multiple 10 percent moves lower uh, over the last few years it does happen uh, risk management is obviously key i think again i've been guilty of this at a very early part of my career where i've gone to sleep or tried to go to sleep and i can't because i'm thinking about a position that i'm too heavily involved in and if that, I mean, as a general rule of thumb, if you can't sleep because you've got an investment, you've probably got too much riding on it. You, your risk management isn't right. You're not diversified enough as well. So diversification can help sort of mitigate any potential losses and help you sleep better at night uh, as well. But importantly, you've got to have a plan. You've got to have a strategy. You've got to stick to it. And that helps ride any potential pullbacks um, you know, out and uh, as we talk about crypto here specifically, this recent pullback that we had on, on Monday evening, I know we bounced a little bit on Tuesday into it. There could still be some downside. There could be some upside. It's, I, I think if we were to move another 10% lower, it can't shock anyone and it shouldn't shock anyone. And if you bought into the, you know, into Bitcoin with the view of holding for the next five, 10, 20 years, or you have a price target in mind, a 10% move lower shouldn't really shock you uh shouldn't really shock you too much and another thing that can help as well is is staying informed on markets by listening to the digest invest podcast brought to you by toro but uh you know you've got loads of news channels out there uh and it can be really really helpful but i think just you want to be as planned and as prepared as possible you made some good points uh and i think that 
we can try and predict market movements as much as we want, but sometimes it's also wrote, uh, worth noting that markets can be unpredictable at times, and that's just fine. How important do you think that investors really understand that? Yeah, I, I think it's it's absolutely crucial for investors to acknowledge the unpredictable nature of markets. Uh, we all wish we had a crystal ball. Uh, we don't, of course. Uh, if anyone does, obviously send it in to us. We'll uh, be very grateful to receive that. You know, I can think of so many times some of the smartest minds in the financial industry have got things wrong. I mean, we're in an election year, and I remember, I mean, 2016, I know it's eight years ago, but the amount of reports that were coming out from your Bloomberg, your CNBCs, your whatever, your Reuters saying, if Trump wins, the market's going to do this. Two months later, if Trump wins, it's going to do that. Literally just saying one thing and so saying the other. And then the market happens. And then obviously, if you were to go back and call out every wrong report, you'd be there for a long time. So, you know, don't, I think it's important to understand that, you know, if you do get something wrong, if you do you get an investment wrong, you do get a trade wrong. You're in a, you know, a group where other people do that as well that have been in the game a much longer time. Um, you know, while obviously analysis, planning, forecasting can all, you know, help along the way, I think just acknowledging that there is going to be uncertainty in, uh, you know, a trade or an investment can really help sort of manage your expectations and help you make more informed decisions. No one's going to win every trade. No one's going to win every investment, you know, in an ideal uh you know, world, your winners are going to lead into, you know, your winners are going to be bigger than your losers. and You're going to have more winners than your losers. But understand that you can't win them all. And, you know, even if you do all your normal approach, your analysis, the investment still might not be a winner. And that is absolutely fine uh, as well. Uh, Josh, I'll start with you. Anything in particular you do just to sort of help uh, in, in periods of, um, you know, a drawdown, whether that be in an individual stock or overall portfolio, is anything you like to do? I think you've got to be comfortable with whatever you're investing. I mean, yes, you made a great point at the start where, you know, if you're, if you're going to sleep in, at night and you can't sleep because of that investment, you really shouldn't be putting that capital to, to sort of out to play. And I think that's really, really important. You know, we talk about crypto. It is still a highly volatile asset class. It is still in its infancy. It's still growing. And you have to understand the volatility that comes with it. Because when we talk about volatility, most people think to the downside, but mm. it's still volatile to the upside. If you move yeah. up what we've seen in the last, what, two years, in the last year, it's moved up over 200%. That is volatility at its best. So if you can deal mm. with that on the upside, you've got to be able to deal with it moving down 20, 30% to the downside at the same time. And I think really going into that, if you're not comfortable with that, you know, invest into something that's more stable, you know, look for a dividend stock, look for, you know, an ETF or look for a portfolio that is not going to have that same sort of volatility. You're not going to get those upside mm. returns that we have seen from crypto assets in the past but you're not going to have to worry about that volatility. So I really do always think coming back to that, you never invest more than you can afford to lose is a really, really important thing that a lot of investors should remember because we can get very caught up in, in sort of FOMO, especially in you know, the market euphoria that we kind of have at the moment and especially with, with crypto as well. Yeah, absolutely. Neja, what about you? Let's just say you're, you're in an investment, it's down 10, 15%. Is it panic stations or for you, is it, you know what, I was getting in for the long, long term, so I'm going to stay for the long term. Yeah, I totally agree with Josh. I think keeping emotions under control is one of the hardest, hardest <laughs> things to do, especially when market is going down. When everything goes up, there's an excitement. And if you are involved, you are happy. But once you see red numbers, it can get hard to get emotions under, under control. And what happens? What happens next? Especially if you're investing more than you can actually afford. Mm. And that is really important, an important fact to consider to keep your expectations on point, not too high, and your emotions under control. I think that's very, very important. Yeah, absolutely. A plan before, plan during, and plan after as well. Josh, Neza, as always, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, guys. See you next week. Take care, everyone.